Baphomet, in my opinion, is one of the most absurdly misunderstood symbols in the occult world. With all the semi-recent political shenanigans going on and the consistent interest, I've decided to come forward and do an explanatory breakdown of the symbolism and philosophy relative to the subject. We won't be covering the name in this particular video, so none of that Ab Optem, Banab de Jet, or Abufi Hamat, Sophia, etc. connections will be shown or expanded herein. I will note that if you haven't seen my video on Zeron Peen, some of these concepts may be a bit harder to swallow. However, the two are intimately related, as we will soon see. With all that being said, my name is River, and I welcome you to the Nimiton, our Grove of Wisdom. We need to know that the artistic depiction of Baphomet was constructed by Eliphas LeVay, a famous occultist from the 1800s under a Kabbalistic influence, meaning that it was majorly sourced from mystical Judaism. How do I know that? Well, fortunately for us, while Baphomet may be misunderstood at large, Eliphas wrote an entire book on the topic titled Dogma et Ritual de la Hoita Magi, or as it may be known today as Waits, and that's Wait from Rider Wait Tarot, mind you, Translation of Transcendental Magic, Its Doctrine and Ritual. Shocking that this text exists, and it seems sparsely represented in the Baphomet debates, yet to get the ball rolling, I've broken down the symbolism into seven segments, and we'll talk on the relevant philosophy of these categories as they come up. The first thing that really grabbed my attention when screening the depiction of Baphomet was the torch attached to the head, which, for explanation, takes us to LeVay wherein it says, The flame of intelligence shining between his horns is the magic light of universal balance, soul above matter, as the flame, whilst being tied to matter, shines above it. Beautiful quote. So let's look at relative symbolism. 1. The upward-facing pentagram, and 2. The wings. We'll spend plenty of time talking about universal balance, so let's put that aside for now. All right. The upward-facing pentagram is readily understood as a symbol depicting spirit above the four elemental forces, which is seen in the quote hermetically as soul above matter. We could also see this as the well-known phrase mind over matter. Now, for the wings, we must note that winged entities are typically associated with spirits and souls, as wings display a being not tethered or bound to the earth. They're celestial or spiritually lifted amidst the physical matter. In the case of birds, we can easily see this in LeVay's quote as, whilst being tied to matter shines above it. Fire, then, this flame of intelligence, is a spiritual form. It's a more pure fire than the physical fire we think of, providing a metaphorical light of guidance. On a literal level, fire and smoke appear to act counter to gravity, rising upwards to the sky and heavens. And as a reference, many messenger deities in history are associated with fire for this very purpose. The flame of intelligence is also seen as Tiferet on the tree of life, tied further to the eternal flame of divine service that is paramount to understanding the way of the Aleph of unity, as expounded upon in the mystical heritage of the children of Abraham, for which it says, Awakening in the path of devotion to Ziran Pin, called Bhakti Yoga in India, results in the transformation of the soul into a tree of perfection, particularly one of the way of the life of unity. I won't be talking on the tree of perfection currently, but it's pretty awesome and we'll get to it sometime in the future. The second segment of this particular talk is the right and left hand. Almost immediately, we note the right hand is facing upward, the left downward. No doubt this is one of the most well-known symbols among even the most inactive dabblers of the occult, that which is above is like that which is below. Beyond that is another common explanation summed up as the right and left hand path popular to a simpler understanding of magic. The right and left hand are better known in the Kabbalah as Chesed and Geburah, or loving kindness and judgment respectively, which also happens to be the focal point of the fourth chapter of the book in question by Eliphas LeVay. Furthermore, these are the hands of Ziran Pin. Let's get this party started with another quote from LeVay, yet paraphrased. He says, There exists in nature a force who is able to adapt and direct the forces 
might thereby change the face of the whole world, having equilibrium for its supreme law. What are these forces that are adapted and directed, we might ask? Specifically, that the left hand of Gaborah expels or pushes away, and the right hand of Chesed accepts or brings in. Hence, Eliphas stating, able to adapt and direct the forces, or as understood to the adepts, unites and directs the divine flux. This is the metaphorical framework for magical practices within the Kabbalah. Now, for my next explanation, we need to realize something very special to our current topic. The artistic depiction of Baphomet has the right hand raised at the viewer's left. Since it is relative to the Kabbalistic diagram, we must now know that Chesed is shown on the viewer's right, which is in the south. Hence, we are metaphorically standing behind the divinity when viewing the Tree of Life. Therefore, in this artistic design, we are standing in the east facing west. Or as Eliphas puts it, the magician, or microcosmic Aleph, he beholds God face to face without dying. So the image is in a sense mirrored and the secret of the significance of this alteration. This character in question, like I said prior, is the magician. Further, why does this matter? Remember that these two spheres are called the hands? There's actually another point made by Eliphas, that of the letter Aleph, again. If you flip a left over its vertical axis, you find something very interesting. That the yods, the Hebrew letters extended off the middle line of the letter Aleph, being yods or hands, one will be facing upward on viewer left and downward on the right. That isn't all, obviously, for the letter Aleph. The middle section of Aleph is a vav, the Hebrew letter representing Zeron Pinion and the number six. It is a vertical axis a vertical firmament, if you will, separating right from left, and this same message can also be found on tarot card 1, the magician. The vav is also doubly important, and that vav is formed of vav aleph vav, which for the first vav, this is the torso, or tiferet, while the second vav is yesod, or the caduceus in this particular image that we will talk about later. Now that we've covered the hands, the third segment is to elaborate on their philosophy, which is salve et coagula. If you look at the picture, you'll note that on the inner side of the forearm, these words are written, salve on the right and coagula on the left. Salve in the occult world is to separate or make distinction between varying objects. Coagula, on the other hand, no pun intended, is to bring together, to congeal and make a collective mass. In a simpler sense, Solve is like bricks to coagula as a building. In the supernal universe, Boaz, or the left-hand pillar in which Geburah is found, is attributed to the monad, such that oneness is the congealment of all things. Solve is of the right hand, representing the purified individual, not the mass. A fun and easy way to symbolize these principles are a black cube for coagula and a white ball for Solve. If we really want to ramp up the subject, let's look to the Hermetic Arcanum for a quotation wherein we find, The whole progress of the philosopher's work is nothing but solution and congelation, the solution of the body and the congelation of the spirit. Nevertheless, there is but one operation of both. How interesting. One operation of both. If we look back to Eliphas, we'll note he states, There are two forces producing equilibrium. And these three constitute a single law. These two forces, as I've noted, are Chesed and Geburah. They produce equilibrium by way of Ziran Pin, who mixes them in Tiferet, which is why it says these three, in relevance to the two forces. The single law is also shown in the Emerald Tablet, at least minor semi-paragraph that is the Emerald Tablet, not all that channeled mumbo-jumbo. Yet we see that which is above is like that which is below, with the full line being to do miracles of only one thing. Anyways, if you thought that was rough, we'll finally be getting into the grittier things, the hard questions. We've spent most of our time talking about dualistic symbols and alluded to harmony or universal balance. We need to bring up the divine hermaphrodite again, so I'm just going to give what is necessary for our topic at hand. Biblically, if we look to Genesis 5-2, we can notice a certain anomaly, wherein it says, Male and female, he created them, and called their name Adam. Considering that line, male and female, and called their name Adam, 
we note this fusion. The idea is that primordial man, called Adam Kadmon, is in a unified state, a sense of being in which both genders are spiritually present and is displayed in the highest name yod heh vav -Heh. Or, as Eliphas explains, whatsoever is subsists in unity, considered as beginning, and returns to unity, considered as end. Hence, the circle we see just behind the caduceus in the Baphomet picture, which we may quote, the serpent's jaw attracts the serpent's tail. We talked a good bit about Xeronpin, since it seems to be the inspirational source for most of Baphomet's artistic depiction, which brings us to what may be the most complicated sector of this particular video. In the Zohar, we learn about how the male and female principles of various divine forms enclose one another. For a quote, in subsection 109, it says, Thus, Ziran Bean became the inner part for his female principle. Then from subsection 69, The revealed world, the female principle of Ziran Bean, is located from his chest downward. See that? The female principle is located from the chest downward, metaphorically like clothing over the body. Looking at the image of Baphomet, we see this shown as a feminine physique from the chest downward, a more literal depiction which also assists in understanding the hermaphroditic symbolism present. Alright, I think the most apparent section, and the one that ties everything together, is the caduceus. We need to start with a quote, and then everything should clear itself up. Going to the same from earlier, with Eliphas LeVay, that we saw, it says, In nature, there are two forces producing equilibrium, and these three constitute a single law. We've talked about a variety of dualistic forces, yet the bisector of this matter, the true symbol, is that of the middle pillar from Kabbalah. The middle pillar, Ziran Pin, Beauty, Tiferet, Balance, all of these ideas and figures are synonymous in many cases. And now we can see the whole of this matter. It is the harmony of uniting these forces that is the objective of all these teachings. The symbol of the caduceus, the two serpents intertwined on a rod, is the most straightforward way of displaying this teaching. The two serpents are the varying dualistic natures, wrapped around and unified on a rod, a literal middle pillar, a wand, if you will. And to point out some of these dualisms and unities, we have the male and female, nature of Baphomet's depiction, the right and left hand, the higher and the lower as the heavens and the earths, all unified by the active component, the character in question. Remember, the third light, which is Xeron Pin, combines the left and right. And now I'll tell you that this is in reference to the verse, separated the light from the darkness, quoting Genesis 1-4. Now that they have been separated via solve, an active component brings them together, which is coagula. This active component is Ciron Peen. Alright, that's enough. Brought to the more direct signs, that of the goat's head. The item in question is called, synonymously to Baphomet today, the goat of Mendes. Eliphas writes on this matter briefly, yet displays his beliefs. Wherein he says, There was an object of adoration in the secret rites of Shabbat, and the temple, which is Baphomet or the Androgynon of Mendes. At this point I assume you're well aware of what's going on, considering that we've covered so many esoteric symbols and relations that this depiction is entirely rooted from the mystical passages of the Torah and the Zohar, which Eliphas seems to believe were likely the oral traditions, or you could say, the secret traditions of the spiritually enlightened, the masters of the word in their time. Especially so considering that the primary dualistic symbol in the Kabbalah, the two pillars of Boaz and Yaakin as seen on King Solomon's temple, are sourced from there. So, it seems rather clear that Baphomet is not an entity in the sense that many people have made him out to be. Zir Anpin is an entity. Which brings us to the question, why is this such a big deal? Well, obviously, idolatry. The Baphomet image wasn't ultimately intended to be a statue or any other manner of form aside from a teaching tool, a preservation of Western occultism as it relates to the Holy Kabbalah. Yet, I'll let you take your own steps from there. We're coming toward the end of our explanatory activities in the final segment of this video, the apex of the subject of Baphomet, which is elucidated, rather fully illuminated, in the 423 riddle, the Riddle of the Sphinx. As Eliphas put it so well, so is this first cause revealed invariably by the cross, that unity. 
If you made it this far, I congratulate you, because the full scene and explanation, the truth, is that Baphomet is illusory to the Philosopher's Stone. It is the means of understanding and revealing the nature of occult metaphysics. Only then is any, en any endeavor to be made on a mystical working successfully. Which is followed with a more hidden section, being 1 Kings 17.1, wherein we see Eliyahu, who states, to a paraphrased extent, do you not know that it will not rain this year without my say, more specifically without my word. This is very pertinent, as the nature of word is immediately relative to the practical application of all of these teachings that I've been giving out these past couple of, you know, well, for this month. Otherwise, you can expect to have some deeper explanations on that in the future. Anyways, I thank you for joining me, and I'll see you next time.